I come and I confess Bowing here, I find my rest Without you, I fall apart You're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you, oh Welcome back to the Adams Family Home. We're in this series, the series we're doing, it's called Running on Empty. And what we've been doing is we've been trying to address some of the things that people are feeling like right now during this current crisis, as well as how not to fall into the same traps and be running on empty when things start to loosen up a little bit. On Easter, we saw that Jesus has a solution. Actually, Jesus is the solution if you feel like you're running on empty. In week two, we talked about lightening our load. And last week, week three, we talked about slowing down. In week four this week, we're going to talk about a choice that is extremely important, both now in the middle of this crisis, as well as moving forward to whatever this new normal is going to be. I'm hoping you don't want to be running on empty anymore. And today will help in that, as well as give you some important things to think about. So let's start with a little participation. I want to ask you to raise your hands if you can identify, or you don't have to raise both of them, just one of your hands, if you can identify with any of these words, if these might characterize your life. If you describe yourself or if you have felt like this, raise your hand. Uh, busy or rushed or empty or stressed or overloaded or superficial. See. I don't want anybody to feel like they're all alone. I have a feeling that most of us probably had our hands up for a number of those words. Misery does love company. I also want you to hear this. If you're watching, 
whether you're a follower of Jesus Christ or not, if you've been invited by somebody or you're just kind of checking out this whole Jesus thing and his claims, I want to say welcome to you. And I want to let you know that this isn't necessarily a Christian versus non-Christian message. This is a message for most people in the 21st century. Busyness is an equal opportunity demon. So no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, I want to ask you to just relax, take a deep breath, just in the nose, out the mouth. Really, what I'd love you to do is I'd love you to just be honest, honest about your pain, honest about your emptiness, honest about the consequences, honest about how you don't want this anymore. So let's go after some answers. Maybe we get done here today with some tools to make us deeper and stronger and healthier and more joyful people. Does that sound good? So if those words I ask you to raise your hand to a moment to go apply to you, if that's how you are or have felt, I'm gonna suggest something. It's lies that keep us busy and stressed and empty. And I wanna talk about a few lies. I wanna suggest this. I wanna suggest that many of us, we won't even see these as lies. When many of you see these lies, here's what you're gonna say. I say this stuff all the time. Or I think this stuff all the time. This isn't a lie. Here's the first lie. There's just not enough time to do everything. Sound familiar? This is a lie. We also say the same thing this way. If there were only more hours in the day, See, truth is, there is just enough hours in your day that God wants for your day. So when we come into this feeling, I wish there were more hours in my day, there's never enough time to do everything, somebody mismanaged their time. It was either you or God. What's your guess? But since none of us here like to take blame, we don't like to blame ourselves for mismanaging time, our priorities, our values, then we actually take a shot at God. And you say, how do we blame God? We do that by saying and thinking things like, if I just had more hours in my day, all I know is this, if you just give me that daylight savings thing where I get that extra hour, if you could do that for me every day, God, that'd be great. See, at some point, when you think there is so much to do, that's a lie that fuels our busyness and our stress. Here's a second lie. Second lie is this. It's just a busy season I'm in right now. I have heard and used this one way too often in my life. It's just a season. And you know how seasons are? Seasons always come to an end. It's just right around the corner. I see better times coming. But all these projects seem to be due. And you think, there's a lot of stuff going on. But when this season is over, we're going to get back to life like it used to be. That is a lie. You see, busy people don't have seasons. Busy people have one season. It's called busy. It's like Arizona. Remember I told you, Julian, I lived in Arizona for three years. Arizona doesn't have seasons. If you've been there, you know it doesn't have seasons. It's like, it's hot. It's always hot. Everything in Arizona is hot. It's not the season in our lives that's busy. It's the person that's busy. We just don't want to admit that we're busy addicts. And if you believe this lie, you will always be busy. So there's just not enough time to do everything. It's just a busy season I'm in right now, and here's a third lie. But this is really important. This task, this person, this meeting, this opportunity that I have. See, we line things up in front of us that are really important, and we're constantly faced with this busyness. Here's the key. It's not just what we think is really important. It's what other people in our world also think is important that we should think is important too. And they put it in our line too. So what others do is they transfer their urgency to become our emergency. Their problem now becomes my problem because it gets on my to-do list and my calendar. What happens then is you're going through life and you're thinking everything is really, really important. Everything is not equally important. See, that's what happens when you're running on empty. When you're running on empty, you don't have the discernment, you don't have the wisdom to make 
that decision to discern and decide what's really, really important. So when everything seems really important, that's kind of a good indication that you're running on empty. When you're running on empty, your perspective is off. Your decision-making becomes blurry. And we crumble under pressure, and here's what we do. We elevate things that aren't really that important, and we devalue things that are really, really important. And you take these lies, lies that many of you, you don't even think they're lies, you've just come to kind of like believe them as part of your life. But you take these lies and you multiply them by what, by what I call the cultural lie. And here's what the cultural lie is. It's a bigger lie and it says, busy is better. That's a lie of the culture. I want you to, here's an assignment, start listening for this in conversations that people have. Start listening for it in television and movies and reading because everybody believes that busy is better. And you may even contribute to it. When you hear somebody greet somebody, how often do you hear this? How are you doing? Keeping busy? Why do we say that? As if busy is the ultimate value. Busy isn't better. Choosing better is better. Busy isn't better. I want you to finish up here today knowing busy isn't better. That choosing better is better. I'm convinced that until we learn to choose better, we will always be running on empty. We'll always be missing the mark. I want to show you an example of this from God's Word. I'm going to move from what you think is only Tim's opinion right to an example from God's Word. In Luke 10, we have a conversation that Jesus has with two people, one who chooses better and one who doesn't choose better. What's interesting about this is it's almost like an aside conversation that happens in the house. It's just like in the brevity of these five little verses, there is such incredible depth. But you're almost waiting for Jesus to bust into this long parable or story because it's, it's just so short, kind of like an aside. It, it says it like this. It's in, in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed, her, welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. Now, I want to call your attention to something that we don't see quite as easily in this text, but in the original, in Greek, they have a way of emphasizing certain words and causing certain verbs to kind of mean certain things. And in this passage, there's two words that are used the same way that are extremely important. And both of those words are in a tense that try to get us to vividly imagine this. Um, think about it like a video or a movie or something that you're watching and you watch it, it's fascinating, and you watch it again and you keep seeing this and you revisit it and you see the vividness and the color in it and try to imagine all that's happening. That's, we have two words that do that. The first one is listening. It says, her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. Luke is emphasizing this. Then in verse 40, but Martha was distracted. And that word is the same tense as a listening, and it's calling attention to our two, those two words for us, that it's listening and distracted. One's listening, one's distracted. And it wants us to kind of vividly picture that happening and see how that does it. It says, Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. See, the, the thing he wants you to focus on is not the dinner, the big dinner, the preparation. It's the distraction. Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord replied to her. The Lord said to her in verse 41, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it and it won't be taken away from her. See, like I said, it's just a really short little conversation. But I want to unpack it just a little bit. Because Jesus comes to this woman's house with his 12 disciples. And what was customary in this time is when you entered somebody's house, they would wash your feet and they would give you some food. That's what they did. Now, I live on a dirt road. We have this dirt road out here and we bought the house. We, we were from the cities and it's like, what's the big deal? It's a half mile of dirt road. It's like, oh my goodness, I get this story about washing feet and stuff. Our cars are almost impossible to keep clean. For them, they walked everywhere and the sand and dirt, you always had messy feet. 
So you walked into the house, you got your feet washed, and you were offered some food. That's what they did. That was their custom. The impression that we get from this text is that Martha was not only hospitable, but that she was probably being too hospitable. It's quite possible that this Martha was like the original, like Martha Stewart Pinterest queen, you know? She's, she's busying herself. She's making some shiplap placemats with built-in coasters out of camel hair or something like that. She's just, uh, and while she's doing that, she's distracted with all the busyness. Her sister displays the opposite action. If she's enjoying Jesus' presence, it says, she's sitting at his feet, listening to him, taking advantage of the opportunity to be with Jesus. The bottom line is Mary chose better. One was busy, one chose busy, one chose better. There's actually a pattern here in this text of busyness, and I think we can see it if we look close enough in our lives too. See, it begins with good intentions. It's always where it starts. Busyness always begins with good intentions. Martha wasn't evil. Martha was being hospitable. She had the right heart. She opened her home to Jesus. And I would say for most, your life began with good intentions. You had good intentions for your kids. You had good intentions for your career. You had good intentions to provide for your family. And the good intentions got that ball of activity rolling. And that's good. And somewhere, somehow, something got lost. And then the second thing happened. After the good intentions, distractions moved in. And you were derailed by these distractions. And that's what happened to Martha. See, we don't even notice this, but there is this pattern. Jesus said she was distracted. Now think about this. Jesus is in your home. He's having coffee in your living room. And what is so important that it had to get done that couldn't wait until he left. See, Martha's distracted by the wrong things. There, there's, I read one commentator, I think it's actually from a paraphrase of this passage, when Jesus says there's so many things, you're worried about so many things, there's only one thing important, that he could have been talking about all the preparations. And they said, we could kind of say in our day that Jesus was telling her, uh, Martha, we only need a casserole, not a smorgasbord because you're worried about way too many things. See, we get derailed by distractions. Distractions can appear as priorities, and priorities then can seem like distractions. Staying focused on what's really important is very tough to do. Then after you're derailed by distractions, here's what happens. Pressure and pity arrive. This is where you begin to have this little pity party for yourself. Martha says in verse 40, Lord, doesn't this seem unfair to you? <laughs> now, we're not told in, text, in the text here what, the, what this boiling point was for Martha, the last straw. We're not told what pushed her over the edge. But whatever it was, it was too much. And she snaps. And by the way, that's usually a sign that you're running on empty when you have no margin in your life, when you have no emotional reserves to pull from when things go wrong. And you say and do things that you regret. So pressure enters and then pity comes. You've done this. You know what this is like. You know, you hear these in your head. My spouse doesn't understand the pressure I feel to get everything done to take care of the kids. My spouse doesn't understand the pressure I feel to provide or to fix this or do that. My parents don't understand the pressure that I feel in school. My friends don't understand the pressure that I feel to keep my head above the water and just keep my bills paid. No one knows how hard it is to be me, that's pity. Then after pressure and pity shows up, guess what's right around the corner? Resentment. You see, that's what busyness leads to. Resentment follows. Verse 40, Martha has another classic line. She tells Jesus, um, tell her to come and help me. And you can almost hear the resentment in her voice. Tell her to come and help me. You tell her, Jesus. And we know what Martha's thinking. Martha's thinking was, if Mary would just be like me, we'd get everything done. The feet would be washed. The dinner would be made. The, the shiplap place mats would be done with the camel hair trim, whatever. All this would be taken care of if she was just like me. So tell her to come help me. So how do we summarize this whole text? We've actually already summarized it. Busy isn't better. Choosing better is better. 
If you and I are going to be able to choose better, one, we've got to be able to recognize the lie. And then two, we've got to be able to recognize the pattern of busyness in our life. And then three, we've got to, we've got to long for and dream for those words of Jesus. You've chosen better. See, while, while Martha worked, Mary worshiped. She chose better. While Martha was distracted, Mary was focused and she chose better. While Martha felt pressure, Mary felt peace because she chose better. Martha, she was filled with resentment, but Mary was filled with enjoyment because she chose better. So how do we take action? What do we do today to take action on when our lives are too busy and there's too much stress and we feel like we're running on empty? Just three things today. Here's the first one. Confess the lie. You identify the lies that we talked about earlier. You confess them. You confess them for what they are. Lies. They're not empowering statements to get you more time. They're tricks. They're sneaky lies that act like landmines to just blow up on you. And when you start to think, there's just not enough time to do everything. I wish I had more hours in my day. Then stop. That's a lie. When you're tempted to say, it's just a busy season right now, go look in the mirror and say, liar, liar, pants on fire, you know, except during this time, I understand that a lot of people don't have pants on, so that's a whole nother thing. Um, whatever you need to do to recognize that it's a lie, recognize it. When you try to justify to a roommate or to a friend or to a spouse, I got to do this. This is really, really important. If it's not, give them permission to call you out on it because it helps you understand that there's only a few things that are really important. So the first one, confess the lies. The second one, name the distractions. This is so important. It's actually very practical, but you're probably gonna be tempted to push it off to the side because it's gonna require some work and you're busy, you're not choosing what's better. But here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. I want you to take a piece of paper sometime today and just begin just write on it, list the responsibilities that you have. Think of all the things that you have to do and just start writing those down. The things that you have to do, the things that um, you ha on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and then look at that list and begin to see if any of them might be distractions. You might even, um, in a very practical way, just pray over them. Look at your list and pray over and say, God, would you give me insight into which of these are distractions? And when you find that they are distractions, then begin to cross them off. You ask God for wisdom to choose what is better. Because remember, busy isn't better. Choosing better is better. See, maybe the most spiritual thing you could do this week is to break open a big can of no on some of those distractions. See, again, we're not talking about things that are necessarily evil. Martha wasn't evil in her distraction. She just needed to say no to some busyness so that she could say yes to Jesus, which is better. So confess the lie, name the distractions, and third, this is a biggie, you choose what is better. At the end of the day, wouldn't it be great to hear the voice of God whisper to you, you've chosen what is better. Let me give you some questions um, to think about this week to unpack how do I choose what's better? Here's some questions for you to think about. Here's the first one. What's my standard for what's better? Because whether you know it or not, you have a standard for what's better. And that's helping you determine which things to choose. Here's what I'm gonna suggest. If you're a follower of Jesus, your standard for what is better is the Bible. It's God's word. We learn it, we listen to it, we live it, we memorize it, we focus on it, we spend time with it every day, and it is our standard. And when we realize that's my standard, the second question is this, am I making my choices by that standard? Because the truth is, you're making your choices by your standard. And if your standard is or should be the word of God, are you making your choices by that standard? And here's the third one. What do I need to choose to say no to today, this week, this month, whatever? And, and the more specific you can be, the better. 
And then I'm going to actually give you a fourth question that's going to prepare you for, for next week. It's kind of homework for next week. And the fourth question is this, how do I choose to refuel when I'm empty? How do I do that? I'm excited about next week. How do you refuel yourself? I want you to start thinking about this ahead of time. How do you refuel yourself when you're empty? That's next week. And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine what your life might look like if you had margin. If you had some breathing room in your life. I want you to picture that. You don't run on empty anymore. You walk on full. And as you walk on full, the fullness of Christ begins to overflow into other people. And your heart is full. And your life is different. Can you picture that for you? The full heart is what God desires. The full heart is really what you desire. And can you see it? I can see it for you. I can see it for me. I can see it for during our church as our church begins to get healthier. So let's go after it. What do you say? This is like so many things, a heart issue. It's an attitude issue. It was not what Martha and Mary were actually doing that was so important to Jesus. It was their attitudes. You see, Martha had the wrong attitude. Mary had the right one. If Martha had had the right attitude, she could have enjoyed Jesus in the middle of her duties. On the other hand, Mary could have been sitting at Jesus' feet for the wrong reason, you know, like laziness. It's not what we do that's most important. It's why we do it. Mary was called out for her worldly anxiety, not for serving. And Mary was commended for her love for Jesus, not because she was sitting. It was because of her heart and her attitude and how she was vividly listening to Jesus and, and, and just enthralled by him and what he was saying. See, remember that there is only one thing needed. That's what Jesus said. No matter what we're doing, no matter how we're, we happen to be busy at the moment, there is one thing that is more important. There is one thing that is needed, and that's fellowship with Jesus. And when we have that, that can never be taken away from us. That's what Jesus said. So what I want for you is I want you to be able to get through this current situation, crisis that we're in better, but I want you to come out the other side better. I want you to come out without the same traps. I want you to come out not feeling like you're running on empty, but that you're walking on full. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today knowing that even during this weird time that we're in, even sometimes when nothing is going on, people can feel busy and rushed on the inside. They can feel that stress. They can feel that anxiety. And we know, Father, that we need to be able to choose the right things. That busyness is not better. That choosing better is better. So I pray that you would help those who are followers of Jesus to, to make that choice. Help us to be able to see that there are certain things that are just lies. And help us to be able to choose what's better. To be able to recognize that, to turn from that lie, and to choose what's better. And Father, for anybody who doesn't know Jesus this morning that's listening to this, my prayer is that in simple faith they would recognize that it's, it's doing what Mary did. It's coming to Jesus. It's being able to come to Jesus and sit at his feet and realize it's not about what I've done or can do. It's about what Jesus has done. And that in simple faith, people would recognize, I know that I'm a sinner. I've made bad choices. I've turned from Jesus. But Jesus, in the middle of that, loved me enough to die on a cross for me. So I recognize that. I recognize my sin. I turn from it. I turn to Jesus today. And I ask you to give me that peace. Help me to walk on full instead of running on empty. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I want to say we miss you guys. Can't wait to, as we transition back in here, are able to see people in, in face to face a little bit more. We don't know how that's going to happen. We know it's probably going to be in phases and we're going to have to do what we always do and be fast, fluid and flexible. 
and we might gain some ground and have to go back. We might make some good phases, get into another and have to go back. We don't know how this is all going to happen, but we're going to do it in a way that honors Jesus, that brings glory to his name and his community. And um, we're going to do it together. So thank you. And I'll see you around.